Hi, David Moore with Equity Advantage, and I've got the pleasure of having uh, Robert Smith, Paragon Private Capital, here today. And uh, we're going to be talking about DSTs. And if you're sort of uh, questioning our, our professional attire, this is what happens when you stick to California boys in, in Oregon and it, and it hits 90 some odd degrees in a day. We've got to sort of find our beach roots again. But uh, that, That's probably the beginning of the end right Yeah, there. the beginning <laughs> of the end, okay. that's the way it goes. But, uh, you know, Bob's been handling DST investments for several decades now and, and he's considered to be one of the one of the monsters of that world and, and uh, very well respected and today we want to uh, get some of your, your wisdom uh, out to our, our investors. So uh, why don't you start off just to explain a little bit about a DST, how it came to be and, and why people might actually uh, want something like that. Uh, we, can, we can do that. You can do that. Uh, DST, uh, as such, has been around for about 20 years. Uh, it's been part of the 1031 exchange process since the late 90s. Uh, it, because it's a Reg D security, awareness of it remains relatively low because in there is a prohibition in place against advertising solicitation, so you're not going to see an ad for DSTs in the Wall Street Journal or Forbes magazine like you do Vanguard mutual funds. That being said, they now make up about 10% of properties used in 1031 exchange on the back end. And the reason for that is very, very simple. It's almost exclusively a demographically driven phenomenon, meaning <clears throat> the population is getting older. Um, I'll go off script a little bit here and admit that I'm 63 years old, and as such, I'm at the tail end of the baby boom generation. And so you've got this huge bulge in the demographic pipeline now approaching retirement age. I analogize it to a snake swallowing an egg. And boomers have had a disproportionate impact on everything that they've come into contact with from a consumption standpoint since the get-go. You know, whether it was Nike tennis shoes, BMWs or McMansions, <coughs> they, they have greatly enhanced demand from a product standpoint. And they like to consume things. They like to consume things. They, yeah, they like to consume things and they like to take care of themselves. Yes. yes, sir. So what you have now is this big demographic block reaching retirement age and they have demonstrably less energy now than they had when they were young. As anybody that owns real estate knows, managing your own dirt in your 20s, 30s, 40s, even your 50s is fine. It's not so fine in your 60s, 70s, and 80s. And so that's the demography driving demand for DST properties. Because people who have built wealth in real estate over their lifetime, they know the asset class, they're comfortable with the asset class. And because of 1031 exchange, they've been able to uh, avoid capital gains tax liability almost all the time. We, we don't like the word avoid. Avoid. De de defer. De de defer. De defer. 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 We're going to talk about defer. God, that, that, is, that is yeah. so much better. <laughs> defer capital gains tax liability. So, 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 Bob, I mean, the DST, and, and, and you know, I obviously, you know, we, it's, it's just something we live with, so we understand what it is and all, but just for the, the audience, would, would you mind? Telling, uh, telling us what a typical DST might look like. I mean, what, what is this thing? I mean, and, and I know it's been sort of cluttered because there's a, a whole other product that now has decided they want to call their product DST also, and it's something that's totally different than what you work with day in, day out. Right, DST is just short for Delaware Statutory Trust, and all that is is the legal format within which the property or properties which are remotely managed are owned. And in a nutshell, what DSTs are anymore, they are small real estate investment trusts. Out of a nod to the fully priced nature of commercial real estate now, most individual DST programs will come with multiple properties inside them. Mm -hmm. If it's an apartment DST, they'll have three or four separate freestanding apartments. Uh, if it's a medical office building, same thing, three or four separate freestanding medical properties. So, so it sounds like you, you've got the ability sort of to uh, diversify without having to diversify. I mean, you're, you're buying an asset that, that has multiple properties, so you're getting some separation, some stability of multiple assets with a single investment. Yeah, it's actually, it's, that I think is the strongest argument for DST 
uh, at our current place in the market pricing cycle because we've obviously had uh, unprecedented appreciation in real estate over the last 10 years driven by the zero rate interest rate environment. That obviously now is changing with rates going up and so to avoid overpaying for a single property on the back end, we think your best hedge is to diversify over multiple properties on the back end of your exchange. And that's what DST allows you to do from a structural standpoint, either through individual DST programs or internally in the DST themselves with multiple properties rather than one. So, so if you look at you, you're, you know, you were talking about people that buy into it. We're talking about it. I, I sort of define it as a, 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 like you said, a mini REIT. I mean, the bottom line is a real estate investment trust. You cannot exchange into. You can exchange into something called an up REIT, but those aren't offered that often. And you do offer those. But uh, the, the problem with the, the REIT product is you can get into it, you just can't get out. Right. Where the DST, you can exchange in and you can exchange out in the future when it, when it matures. Right. Uh, which I guess sort of leads me to the next thing. I, I guess, you know, if we look at the people that buy into these things, they're, they're great. And often it, it's a situation where it's an end game for somebody. Or the other thing is it's a fallback for somebody, right? I mean, in today's market, it's a great time to sell things. It's hard to find what you want. So you might fill a gap or that, that, that last piece of investment, somebody buys something and they've got some money left, you provide that opportunity for people. But, but the DST product is great because you're, you're looking at sort of a mini REIT, you've got some diversification, you've got the ability to get in, get out. If we look at the DST product versus uh, a tick, a tenancy in common, you mind saying a few words about that? And, and, and I guess I put it out there, uh, the, the whole tick world got sort of blown up during the crash and it wasn't, you know, I don't look at it as, as a tick, the, the structure is the problem, obviously it was the sponsors and as a, a result of the marketplace at that point in time, but if you look, just compare and contrast real quickly the tick versus uh, DST and the DST is it, it's the DST is infinitely fungible because there isn't a limit in terms of the number of investors, practically speaking, that you can have in any one DST. You can pretty much slice it and dice it whatever way you want as an investor. You can put in as little equity or as much equity as you want. Whereas uh, tick programs back then tended to concentrate assets in an individual property and obviously concentration of assets increases risk rather than diversification of assets which decreases risk. And at that time, I mean 2008 was an anomaly because the housing market was so terribly, terribly overheated that exchange demand was just off the charts as David knows. And if we had a good program coming to market, say a 20, 30 million dollar equity raise from a property standpoint, it would be sold out, fully subscribed, the first day it hit the street with 20 million dollars in backlog from an order standpoint. Wow. So what that did was any hot money environment, whether it's real estate, uh, internet stocks, Bitcoin, what have you, it always attracts bad actors and that attracted bad actors into the space. There were over a hundred different property providers in 2008, most wow. of whom were opportunistic. How many, how many are there today? Uh, active, uh, about 30. It's a much, much, much uh, better police space from an oversight standpoint now. So, so of those 30, how many were there before the crash? And you're seeing that this market starting to get filled up again today, right? You're yeah. seeing sort of a rehash of what happened before. So, 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 so once again, back to my initial question, how many of the initial group are here today and are you see, what are you seeing happening right now in this uh, space? The same thing, albeit to a lesser extent, of uh, that crop of 30 or that group of 30 property providers in the DSD space currently, only three or present or extant prior to 2008. Wow. The Inland Group, which is the 800-pound gorilla in the, in the DST space with 60% market share. PASCO, which is number two with about a 25% market share. That's 85% of the DST market there, wow. two companies. And then a small, albeit very, very high quality company out of Minneapolis called AEI mm -hmm. that's been bringing all cash programs to the market 
forever. So, so it's hard to have a problem, a loss. Uh, you might have a loss of value, but it's hard to have a loss of a property if there's no debt on it, as, as we were talking about in, in, a, in another uh, video recently. Uh, save the sweat, underwrite yeah. any real estate, yeah. it's all cash. So. Yeah. Uh, so, so that whole leverage thing. So, so we're on that topic. I mean, I moved. I moved to Oregon from California in, in '90 to buy property, and, and at that point in time, uh, my brother and I are partners and stuff, and, and we just looked at the market. And hey, the, the higher the leverage, the better. We didn't. We didn't really care. I mean, obviously, we young guys, and, and if there was a problem with something, we we deal with it. Uh, I'm, I'm a little older than I was, and hopefully I'm a little bit wiser. I know I've been kicked in the head a few times. I'm, I always jokingly say I'm happy to learn. I'm getting tired of being taught things. <laughs> but, 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 if you, but, but if you look at stuff and you look at that leverage, obviously young, you're going to be higher LTVs, and as you get older, you're probably going to be more conservative unless you're some wild man out there. But if you look at LTVs, loan-to-value on assets, if we look at what products you guys are able to actually sell. Well, what is the typical loan to value or what is the range? I mean, if somebody had a situation where, you know, unfortunately we had, had uh, you know, some foreclosure tra transactions with phantom, you know, phantom gains mm -hmm. where, you know, we're talking debt over basis triggering the tax and, and, you know, on a home you've got some tax relief, but on investment properties you don't. You know, I, I know you guys have some product out there where you can get pretty high leverage for that person that just needs to get something. That, that's a very, very good point, David, um, particularly given, as we discussed earlier, the older nature of the DST investor population. So uh, leverage on DSTs tends to be lower by commercial real estate standards, meaning most DST product will be leveraged uh, anywhere between 40 and 50, 55 percent. And historically, that's a fairly conservative level of leverage or debt for commercial property. That being said, as David just mentioned, there were people coming out of distressed situations pre-2008 that need more leverage rather than less. To that end, uh, and I'll brag a little bit, at my urging, the Inland Group created what's called a zero coupon DST. And it works just like a zero coupon bond. It's a very, very high quality credit tenant a portfolio of Walgreens stores. We just did uh, uh, the headquarters building for Zurich America Insurance Company, North America. And it will be 80, 81, 82% leveraged. And, but like a zero coupon bond, instead of the rents being paid out monthly to investors, the rents are paid into the product itself, paying down the mortgage debt in a very, very aggressive fashion. So by buying or taking bits and pieces of a product like that, an individual in extremis that needs to add leverage to his or her equation to avoid a significant tax liability can very easily avail themselves of that product. And that's something that I think is unique or anomalous to the GST. No, that, that's great. I know we've had some, some clients going in just to pick up that balance, that, that remaining right. piece that they needed Correct. to. And, and been able to take care of that, so that's great. So if you so if you look at the DST product and and uh, you look at you know the upsides we've been talking about all the the, the pluses of the stuff, is there a downside to them? Uh, the only minus that you know the the issue uh, is liquidity uh, because it's commercial real estate. It's you know, it is direct ownership in dirt. And as everybody that's owned and managed dirt knows, it's expensive to buy dirt, it's expensive to sell it. So unless you're really, 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 really in the right place at the right time, you're going to own it for a while. So it's an inherently illiquid asset. It's not like picking up the phone, buying a thousand shares of Amazon. Today I change my mind, I sell it tomorrow, there's a check in my account. You're going to have it for a while. So the liquidity or the liquidity event is an issue in terms of how long I'm going to own this asset. The historic ownership average for DSTs the last 20 years has been six years. It can be shorter than that. It can be longer than that, depending on market conditions. The decision to sell any DST is always opportunistic. It's always market driven. Um, but interesting enough, 
everyone, when they're, when they're going into a DST, they voice their principal concern as well, how do I get out of this? But what's fascinating is once people get into it, because they're doing it because they want to disengage and have someone manage all their assets for them remotely. They want to go from the I manage managers or manage property to the mailbox money business. And once they get in it and it's working, the last thing they want to do is sell the property. So we run into more opposition when it comes time to sell a property even though we have significant appreciation built up in it and can show our investors uh, uh, mid-high teens internal rates of return. People are familiar with it, they're comfortable with it, and they usually don't want to sell it. Well, it's, it's funny that you're talking about that because it, definitely the conversation when we, and, and we don't uh, obviously, as you know, if I'll let the audience know, we, we do not sell investments or give investment advice, but uh, when we're talking to somebody, uh, somebody asks us about other investments, other places to go with their money, we bring up the DST and you know they ask and we'll say, well, yeah, the liquidity deal. And, and you know, back to your point, and it's sort of funny because I know you've been turning some properties. I'll, I'll say, in my in, in my speak, short cycling things where you know they're, they're being turned sooner than what those investors thought, and and now they're all upset, like you said. And so it's sort of interesting how that works because you get in there, you establish an expectation, and it's like, well, gee, this is a pretty nice deal, and hey, now I now I don't want to have it go away. But but you've got, I mean, as far as product, it's it, it seems like there's always there's always product available yes. somewhere on this stuff, and and like geographically, I mean, as far as different asset types, and 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 I mean, you basically, I, I, for lack of a better term, I'll call it the food group. You know, whether it's multifamily or office industrial or region or whatever it is, and you regionally, your sponsors probably try to keep things geographically in a state or or you know, so you're not having to file multiple tax returns. Is that the case? That's exactly the case, and there was an excellent uh, article or editorial in the uh, Wall Street Journal that I kept about two uh, weeks ago, written by Arthur Laffer, the famous economist, <clears throat> you know, the uh, author of the Laffer Curve, basically the, uh, uh, the creator of Reaganomics, and he made the point that the new Tax Reform Act is going to take that steady movement or trickle of people and money out of high tax, high regulatory threshold blue states into low tax or no tax, low regulatory threshold red states and turn it into a flood because the new tax bill caps your state tax deductibility on your federal form at 10%. So that's going to accelerate all these high net worth individuals and businesses leaving places like California and New York and going to places like Arizona, Texas, Florida. So you'll see the majority of DST product in that area, what we call smile states, which are the, mo which are the, the best from a tax standpoint and the best from a business standpoint, simply because they're experiencing the strongest growth in the United States. Big article today about... See, 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 there you go, the little nugget of knowledge. I always talk about these things. You don't have to know everything, you just got to have those little nuggets of knowledge. So, so Bob, I, I just want to thank you very much for coming to join us today. That, that, uh, is there anything else you'd like to sort of add in at the end here? I, I think that, that, was a, that was a great little piece of knowledge I didn't have, and I didn't have to get kicked in the head to get it. So I appreciate that. Uh, anything else that you'd like to say? That, that, once again, I'll just say Robert Smith, Peregrine Private Capital, and uh, he's, he's been handling these things for, for a number of years and, and does a fine job with it. Anything you'd like to? I'd just like to thank you for the opportunity okay, great. to participate in this. Well, we'll do it again. And, and if you've got questions, please uh, don't hesitate to holler and, and let us know what you've got questions on. We'll be happy to address them in a video in the future. Thank you very much. And we look forward to speaking and working with you soon. Thank you.